This third Sunday of Advent is called Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete in Latin means rejoice. It is the first word of the introit or entrance antiphon of this Mass. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Indeed, the Lord is near. Today, in the signs of our Savior's coming, we have a foretaste of the joy of Christmas. John the Baptist compares his joy to that of the best man at a wedding. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is now full. Christ is the divine bridegroom, who by becoming man has wedded our humanity, and St. John the Baptist rejoices to make way for him. Isaiah had prophesied a new exodus, a royal road through the desert that would lead Israel and the nations into God's kingdom. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the Holy Way. The redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This exodus of the redeemed is the way to paradise restored, said Isaiah. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Today, a second shepherd has arrived in our nativity scene to represent Moses, through whom God freed Israel from slavery in Egypt around the year 1250 B.C. At the time of Moses' birth, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had issued a population control decree for the Hebrews, requiring that their male children be killed. However, the Hebrew midwives were God-fearing women and refused to carry out Pharaoh's order. When Pharaoh saw that he could not enforce his cruel edict, he commanded, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. In this terrible situation, the baby Moses was born. His mother hid him for three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds at the river's brink. The Hebrew word for basket is the same word used for the Ark of Noah. We could refer to this little basket as the Ark of Moses. Moses' sister, Miriam, hid in the distance to see what would happen to her infant brother. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river and found the child and took pity on him, raising him as her own son, and she named him Moses. Moses' life, at its most fragile moment, was saved by five women, his mother, the two midwives, his sister Miriam, and Pharaoh's own kind-hearted daughter. Thanks to this Egyptian princess, Moses not only survived but was nursed by his natural mother and was raised as a prince. Without these women, there could have been no exodus for Israel. So also without Mary, there would be no God-made man, no Jesus Christ, to be our Savior and Redeemer. Jesus' cradle recalls the little ark in which the infant Moses, and therefore Israel, was saved. Mary is a living ark, the chosen vessel full of grace, through whom salvation came to us and still comes to us in Christ. When the Holy Family flees to Egypt and then returns to the Holy Land, St. Matthew tells us, that this reenacts the pattern of Israel's exodus. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt 
have I called my son. The story of Moses makes clear that human life is sacred from conception, because God alone is the Lord and giver of life. The fifth commandment is, You shall not kill. Moses said to the Israelites as he neared the end of his life, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your descendants may live. As Catholic Christians, we are indeed pro-human life, because we are pro-eternal life in Jesus Christ. The Catechism teaches that human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. From the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. One of the, of the very earliest Christian writings outside the New Testament is the first century Didache. It says this, You shall not kill the embryo by abortion, and shall not cause the newborn to perish. The Catechism teaches also that euthanasia, or so-called mercy killing, is a murder gravely contrary to the dignity of the human person and to the respect due to the living God, his Creator. Ordinary care, such as food and water, is always required. However, one may discontinue medical procedures that are extraordinary or disproportionate, so as to allow natural death to occur. It is permissible to use painkillers to alleviate suffering even if these may shorten the dying patient's life. Likewise, the entire Catholic tradition has always held that, in principle, the state has the right to impose the penalty of death for grave crimes. Certainly, the law of Moses prescribed execution for many offenses. St. Paul says in Romans 13 that the political ruler does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Has Catholic doctrine changed? No, the Pope cannot overrule the word of God. The First Bat Vatican Council taught that the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter that is, to the popes, not so that they might, by his revelation, make known some new doctrine, but that, by his assistance, they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation, or deposit of faith, transmitted by the apostles. Moral principles do not change, but their concrete legal application can vary in different times. It is reasonable to maintain that as a matter of penal law, the modern state should refrain from actually exercising its right to execute criminals if there are alternatives. Human justice is fallible, and the innocent have sometimes been wrongly convicted. Also, capital punishment can easily be abused as an instrument of state terror or political revenge or religious or anti-religious persecution. Justice requires fitting punishment of criminals, but redemption and repentance are possible even for serious offenders. According to traditional Catholic doctrine, it is permissible to use lethal force in self-defense, for example, in a just war. Such self-defense can be not only a right, but a serious obligation for those responsible for the lives of others, as in the family or in the life of the state. The essential point is expressed by St. Paul. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. 
So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's.